האם זה באמת סגולה בדוקה? הסגולה ללמוד בזה? Arab Tov and good evening everyone. We are in the Zera Shimshon on our double parsha of Matos Mase. We're going to take a look at the Zera Shimshon's piece uh, on Parshas Mase. This is Os Aleph, section number one. And in order to prepare to study this piece, we're going to take a look at Tupsukim from very close to the beginning of Parshas Mase. This is Perak Lamed Gimel, Bamidbar Perak Lamed Gimel, Psukim Gimel and Dalit. It's talking about the journeys of B'nai Yisrael, all going all the way back to the beginning of the exodus from Mitzrayim. And they traveled from Ramses during the first month. Of course, that's the month of Nisan. On the 15th day of the first month. On the day after the bringing of the Korban Pesach, Yotzu B'nai Yisrael, B'nai Yisrael went out, B'yod Ramah, with an uplifted hand, Le'ene Kol Mitzrayim, and the eyes of all of the Egyptians, and the eyes of all of Egypt. Next Pasuk, Mitzrayim Mekabrim, Eis Asher Hiko Hashem Bohem Kol Bechor, the Egyptians were burying all of the uh, people who had died when Hashem struck the firstborn. And amongst the gods, their gods, the Egyptian gods, Hashem had also uh, taken judgment, had also inflicted judgment upon the gods of Egypt as well. Those are the two psukim, and now Os Aleph, uh, on Parshas Mase in the Zerah Shimshon. Umitzrayim mekabrim v'chule, and Egypt, the Egyptians were burying, etc. Uveloheihem osa Hashem shivotim, and amongst their gods, Hashem did judgments. Koshe, this is difficult. Dema inyin umitzrayim mekabrim im uveloheihem osa Hashem shivotim. What's the connection the Zerah Shimshon asks between the two halves of the Pasuk? The first part says that uh, the Egyptians were burying their dead. And the second half said Hashem had also punished their gods. And we've seen that the Zerah Shimshon always feels there should be a certain consistency, a certain uh, continuity in each Pusuk, that a Pusuk should never mention two totally different ideas that don't have anything to do with each other. Uh, though, if you have two ideas which are really disconnected, then they should be in two different Pusukim from the perspective of the Zerah Shimshon. So he's asking, as again, as we've seen in the past, what's the connection between the first part of the Pusuk, dealing with the Egyptians burying their dead, the firstborn dead, and the second part of the Pusuk where it says that Hashem uh, took out punishments against the, the gods of the Egyptians. The cause of HaBachaya, and uh, the Zerah Shimshon quotes Rabbeinu Bachai, Parshas Bo, in Parshas Bo he wrote, at night, the Egyptians did not feel, they were not cognizant of the punishments that Hashem had taken out against their idols and against their gods. Because they were totally involved, totally taken up. Their focus was totally on the death of the firstborn. Everyone was in shock. Everyone was dealing with their tremendous loss, the tremendous loss of life and the loss of loved ones. But in the morning, when they went to the house of their idols, uh, people would go, went in the morning to, to pray or to begin funeral rites at the, at the houses of idol worship. Hikiru. Then they recognized and saw the damage that Hashem had inflicted upon their idols. The Hirgishu, and then they felt it. But this was only the morning after Hashem had done these things. After the night of Makas Bechoros, which is when Hashem had inflicted the uh, punishment upon the, the destruction, I should say, upon the idols. Kemoshe Matsino Bidagon, Bime Plishtim. As we find regarding the famous idol called Dagon, which was a fish idol, uh, 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 mostly a fish body, but with the 
with parts of a, of a human being also. That's the idol that they worship called Dagon, the Plishtim did. And we find in Shmuel Aleph, uh, you can see there, Perak Hay, that when the Plishtim captured the Aaron of Hashem, when the Plishtim captured the Ark of the Covenant, uh, and they held it in their possession for seven months. During that time, they were inflicted with terrible punishments. But in the very beginning, they brought the Aaron and they put it inside of the temple of Dagon. This was a way of glorifying their idol and saying, look, in our temple of Dagon, we have the captured Ark of the Covenant of the Jewish people. And it's, it's a, it was like a trophy there. However, the next morning when they came in, we see in the Navi, that the idol had fallen over and the, each, each, and they set it up again and the next morning it had fallen over again and it had broken. So what we see, uh, the Zer Shimshon is bringing in that incident to show you that Hashem uh, 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 destroyed or broke up the idol, knocked over and broke up the idol at night, but they didn't see it till they came in the next morning. So too by the Egyptians, they were not, did not become cognizant of the destruction of their idols and their temples until the next morning after the plague of the firstborn. Vizehu, and this is the reason, reason, that in the description of the events of the killing of the firstborn in the Torah, the Torah does not mention the striking by Hashem of the gods and idols of the Egyptians. Ad Khan Lashono, until here is a quote from Rabbeinu Bachaya. So the Zer Shimshon did not bring this uh, piece, this excerpt from Rabbeinu Baha'i to answer his question. He brought it in as a building block. It's his first building block that he wants us to become aware of. So uh, the question still stands. He still wants to ultimately explain to us why, what's the connection between the idea of the Egyptians burying their dead and the punishment that Hashem wreaked upon their idols. So we're continuing. The previous Pasuk to the one that the Zer Shimshon asked about, and we read this Pasuk uh, in the beginning, stay, Omar says, On the morning after the uh, Korban Pesach was uh, offered, B'nai Yisrael uh, uh, left Egypt with an uplifted uh, arm or uplifted hand, le'ene kol mitzrayim, in the eyes of all of the Egyptians. The kosha, and there's a problem with this puzzle. The bishlama, it would make sense, im mamtin la boker, if Hashem had the B'nai Yisrael wait to leave till the morning, ad shiye le'ene ha'olam, in order that the whole world would see and witness and hear about their uh, exodus, they're leaving Egypt. Nicha, then that would make sense that instead of leaving at night when they could have left, and when after Makas Bechoros, the Egyptians were telling them, leave, leave, we can't take it anymore. Um, it would have made sense for them to wait till the morning if the Pusik said the whole world needed to see this. Hashem wanted everyone to see this in the light of day. But if Hashem's plan was that the Egyptians should see them leaving and be aware that they were leaving, that goal could have been fulfilled even if they left at night. Shahare kulam trudim b'makas pechorehem. All of them, as the Zer Shimshon told us, were involved with the dealing with the loss of the firstborn and the dead bodies that each house had, a, as the Torah tells us, each house, there was no house without a dead body, without a dead firstborn. And they were all dealing with the loss and the trauma and the shock. And the Egyptians were, you were strongly telling the Jews uh, in order to leave. The Egyptians were uh, doing everything they could to get the Jews to leave. So that was going on during the night of Makas Bechoros. So why did Hashem say, don't leave at night and only give the order to leave the next morning if all, if Hashem's goal was only that the Egyptians should be aware of the fact that the Jews were, were leaving Biyad Ramah with an uplifted arm, that could have happened at night, the Zer Shimshon asks. The Adarabah, and just the opposite, Lehamtin Laboker, to wait, to specifically hold up the process and wait until the morning, Hayulolochush, Hashem should have been concerned, Penyechazek Libam. 
perhaps the Egyptians would have strengthened their heart by the time the next day came. Ho'il she'ovra hamaka, because the plague would have passed. Perhaps during the night they were in shock, but the next morning maybe they would have re- the Egyptians would have regained their composure. V'lo yirtzu od lishloch es Yisrael, and they would no longer have wanted to send out their slaves, the Jewish people. Kimosha osu b'chol shar hamakos, like we saw what actually happened with the other makos during the duration of the plague, the Egyptians, and sometimes it even reached as high as Paro himself, said, enough already, we can't take it, the Jews can leave. But then once the plague stopped, they changed their mind and they did not relinquish uh, their uh, power over B'nai Yisrael. So, so waiting until the next morning, the Zerah Shimshon says, seems like a very dubious, a very questionable uh, practice or idea uh, from Hashem because the Egyptians could have changed their mind and then uh, Hashem did not want the Jews to have to fight their way out. The whole point was that B'nai, that uh, Egyptian, the Egyptians would be so uh, so distraught, so discouraged, so downtrodden, so humbled that they would insist that the Jews leave as opposed to B'nai Yisrael having to fight their way out. L'chein, bottom, uh, bottom paragraph, L'chein, therefore, Baha Kosov, the tirades. Therefore, the Pusuk comes to answer this question. There was no reason, there was no place for this concern. Because in the morning, when B'nai Yisrael left Egypt, the Egyptians, as we said, were busily preparing the dead, their, their uh, burying, preparing and burying their dead with all of the rituals and the rites of their idols, and, al- and along with the destroyed idols. And that's when they felt and realized that their idols had been destroyed overnight, that not just had they lost their firstborn children, but they had lost their idols in their temples of idolatry. The Imkain Nikra Shasamaka Mamish. And if so, the morning was still considered and could still be referred to as the time of the plague. And therefore, it was not possible. There was no reason to be concerned that they might change their mind and, and retract their urgings for B'nai Yisrael to leave. The HaKadosh Baruch Hu Ratza, and Hashem wanted, Sheyargishu af b'makazu le'enei Yisrael. Hashem Dafka wanted that B'nai Yisrael should witness the pain and the suffering that the Egyptians felt the next morning over when they discovered the loss of their idols in their temples. Umishum hachi, and there because of this, Himtin Yitziosam al Haboker, Hashem held up. He delayed their exodus until the next morning. Vizehu hatam lesmichos mikros halolu. And this is the reason for combining the two different ideas, the two different phrases in the Pasuk that we read. So now let's go back and put the building blocks together to understand how the Zerah Shimshon answered his original question. The Pasuk that he was referring to first talked about the Egyptians burying their dead. And then it talked about, uh, about um, the, the Hashem doing uh, punishments, Hashem destroying the idols in the temples of idolatry that belong to the Egyptians. And the Zer Shimshon said, what's the, what's the uh, connecting point? And so the Zer Shimshon has shown us that there's a very strong connecting point because Hashem could have, and from a certain perspective, you might say it would have been re- very reasonable for Hashem to have B'nai Yisrael leave as soon as possible. And as soon as the Egyptians at night were crushed by the death of the first deaths of the firstborn and so totally demoralized that they were saying, Jew to the Jews, leave, leave. Perhaps Hashem should have taken that opportunity, that golden opportunity, and had B'nai Yisrael start leaving right at that time in the, in the middle of the night or before the, the dawn. However, Hashem specifically wanted B'nai Yisrael to witness another step in the punishment inflicted upon the Mitzrim, and that did not take place until the next morning because only the next morning did the Egyptians discover the destruction to their idols and their temples of idolatry. 
and that was added to their suffering over the loss of the firstborn. And, uh, and, and Hashem wanted B'nai Yisrael to see that and to understand that not only did Hashem punish the Egyptians for the way that they treated B'nai Yisrael, but he punished, punished them for their idolatry and he dealt with their idols and their temples. And, and therefore, it, everything had to wait until the next morning so that they would, the B'nai Yisrael would see the Egyptians burying their dead and would see them also dealing with the loss of their temples and their idols. Now the Zer Shimshon continues with another point. The Asi Shapir Nami, and now that we understand this, it also makes sense, Sha'amar Hakasov, that the Pasuk says, Biyad Rama, that B'nai Yisrael lift with an uplifted arm. Ubishar Makomos, but in other places, Ksiv the Torah writes, Biyad Chazaka, with a strong or with a mighty arm. Why the difference from Biyad Chazaka, a strong arm, a powerful arm, to Biyad Rama with an uplifted arm? Lefi, because Shebekan Maire Sha'asa Shvatim Velohehem, because here, our psukim are talking in the beginning of Parshas Masay, it's talking about Hashem doing uh, justice and destroying the idols of Egypt. Umikan muchach shehu ram al kol ramim. And this event proved that Hashem was above even the loftiest and highest uh, things that belonged to the Egyptians. Not only did Hashem show his power over the Egyptians, who after all, as powerful as they were, were mere mortals, they were just human beings, but Hashem showed his complete dominance over their alleged gods, over the gods that they worshipped and believed in and thought were all powerful. And that's why it says, Biyad Rama, with a high uplifted hand to refer to the fact that Hashem not only uh, punished the Egyptians, but destroyed their gods as well. And so too we see in Pashas Bishalach Ksiv Biyad Rama, it also talks about the uplifted hand, Mishum Dohasam Nami Mairi, because there also it's discussing Sheyachsuru Lifne Balsephon, that Hashem had said to Moshe, tell the Bnei Yisrael to turn back and go and camp in front of Balsephon, which was an, the last existing idol of, of the, that the Egyptians worshipped that had not yet been destroyed. And so Hashem wanted the Jews to go back towards Egypt and camp Dafka in front of this idol. Which was the only one that remained from all of the idols and gods of uh, false gods of Egypt. In order to cause the Egyptians to err and to think as they did. Oh, we still have an idol that has power. And our idol of Baal Siphon is not letting B'nai Yisrael leave. And therefore, they came back, they turned back from escaping, and they camped in front of Baal because the power of Baal is too strong for them. And the Egyptians thought the power of Baal was even too strong for Hashem. And that's exactly what HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted them to think, because he wanted to deal and crush once and for all their ideology and their idol of idol worship. Aval Yisroel. However, B'nai Yisrael, and now the Zerah Shimshon is connecting to some point that he made before, which dealt with the um, mourning and the suffering that the Egyptians felt during the night of, the, of Makas Bechoros and dealing with the burials the next morning. Aval Yisrael kiblu aleihem din shamayim b'simcha. B'nai Yisrael had an entirely different reaction when their relatives died. Kishemesu krovehem. Uh, and they, and they showed simcha, they showed rejoicing when some of their relatives died. Shenamar, as the Pusik says, Ulechol b'nei Yisrael haya or b'mosh vosam. To all of b'nei Yisrael, there was light in their dwellings. This, of course, is a reference to a Pusik uh, back in Shemos when the makas choshech, uh, when the plague of darkness is described in the Torah, the Torah says, uh, the Egyptians were struck with complete and utter darkness that was so thick that they couldn't even move around. And the, but the Jewish people, B'nai Yisrael, had or b'mosh vosam, had light in their dwellings. And the Zerah Shimshon takes that based on Chazal as a reference to not just light, but simcha, joy. V'koshe, and this is difficult, mahu, ma, mahu b'mosh vosam, hayo, b'mahu b'mosh vosam, why does it say they had light 
specifically in their dwelling places. Hayo lo lomar, the Torah should have said hayo or. They had light, meaning light everywhere. Visu lo, and nothing more. It shouldn't have restricted the light to say they had light in their dwelling places. Why? The Zerashimshim is asking, why did the Torah specifically say they had light inside their homes where they lived? And inside their dwelling places, why didn't it just say the Egyptians were experiencing total darkness everywhere they were, and Bnei Yisrael had light every uh, period everywhere they went? The Yesh Lomar, and we can say Shebol Etaret that the Torah said this in order to answer Mashe Kosha Al Dirush Razal, a question that is asked on a drusha, a famous drusha of Chazal. Shebishloshes Yemei Afela that during the three days of Choshech, of darkness, Chipsu Yisrael Bebeis HaMitzrim, the Jewish people went and searched inside of the homes of the Egyptians. The, right? So, so we, the Chazal talk about this in reference to the fact that before the Bnei Yisrael left, uh, Hashem uh, told Moshe to tell Bnei Yisrael, ask the Egyptians for beautiful clothing and, and, and uh, vessels of gold and silver to take with you on your journey as you leave Egypt. And the Chazal asked the question, but obviously the Egyptians are going to say, what are you talking about? We don't have any beautiful garments or beautiful uh, gold and silver vessels. And so what, what was the plan? During the plague of Choshech, when the Egyptians couldn't stop them or even see them, the Jews went into the Egyptian homes, found out where everything of value was, and then they came back at the time of before they left and they said, oh, you don't have anything. What about this particular robe and this gown and this uh, golden vessel and this necklace and this piece of jewelry? They knew where everything was. But, but, the, but the Zerah Shimshon says there's a problem. How could it be possible that during the three days of darkness, Yasu Yisrael Chippus Zeh, B'nai Yisrael, the Jewish people, carried out this search. The halo, and isn't it true? Kulam hayu avelim, all of them would have been in mourning. The chafoy rosh, and they would have been covering their head with ashes because of their great loss. Al krovehem, on their relatives. Va'al achehem, and on their brothers, their brethren, shemesu, who died. Ki arba halakim mesu, because four fifths of the Jewish people died during the three days of darkness. So the Zerah Shimshon here is bringing two statements by Chazal about what took place, what transpired during the three days of darkness. And he's saying the two statements by Chazal seem to be problematic. They don't seem to go together, they clash. Why? Because on the one hand, Chazal teaches us that during the plague of Choshes, four fifths of the Jewish people, who did not deserve to be redeemed, died. And on the other hand, which, which should have brought national mourning and, and a national sense of catastrophe to the Jewish people. But on the other hand, the Torah, tell, uh, the Chacham, I'm sorry, Chazal tell us that during the three days of Choshech, Bnei Yisrael were going into the homes of the Egyptians to search out and to discover the hiding places of their, uh, of their uh, beautiful garments and vessels. So it doesn't fit, doesn't make sense that both of those things were happening at the same time. The Yesh Lomar and the Zer Shimshin says, we can answer the Isa B'Shulchan Aruch Yoridea. It states in Shulchan Aruch Yoridea, Kol HaPorshim Midarche Tzibor. This is a, a chapter in Shulchan Aruch Yoridea that deals with, uh, that whole section over there is dealing with Avelis, the laws of mourning. And it says, for all Jews who depart, who break away from the religious ways of the congregation, uporkim ol mitzvos, and they remove the yoke of mitzvos, the responsibility of doing mitzvos, me'al tzavaram, from on their necks, meaning they, they claim and they live their lives as if the responsibility to do mitzvos doesn't apply to them. Ve'ein nichlolim b'chal Yisrael, and they do not include themselves Amongst B'nai Yisrael, they say, no, nope, we're, we're, uh, we're humanists. We're, we're uh, people who don't uh, belong to the Jewish people. They denounce their membership and their citizenship in, in, amongst uh, B'nai Yisrael. Ain onen in alehem, then all the laws of aninus, which is the first stage of mourning, uh, do not apply to them. The ain misablim alehem, and we do not mourn the loss of such people, people who uh, reach such a nadir, such an abyss and low point 
uh, spiritually that they denounce, they keep no mitzvot, they think mitzvot, they claim mitzvot don't apply to them, and they denounce their membership uh, among the Jewish people, there is no mourning, no halachas of mourning for them. But rather, and listen to this incredible statement from the Shulchan Aruch, they're the brothers of these people who, who uh, when, they, when these such people die and their rel- other relatives, they should wear white clothing, which is a sign of joy. And they should wrap themselves with head coverings of white, which again was only done on holidays. And they should eat and drink and be misameach. They should show joy as opposed to any kind of sense of loss or mourning over the loss of such uh, individuals. The af elu, and now the Zer Shimshon comes back to uh, Bnei Yisrael at the time of the uh, plague of Choshech. The af elu shemesu, and so to these people who died, the four fifths of the nation that died during the plague of Choshech, tam misasim haya. The reason for their deaths was they did not want to accept upon themselves the burden of mitzvos, the responsibility of doing mitzvos. And to be included amongst the Jewish people, they too, the four-fifths of the people of the nation who died during the plague of Choshech, said, we're not leaving, we're Egyptians. We don't identify with the slaves of Bnei Yisrael. We're not like them. We're not a part of them. And therefore, their relatives did not mourn for them. But the opposite, they showed joy over the loss. This is a Pusik in Mishle, which says, with the loss or the destruction of the wicked comes Rina, comes singing and joy. In ancient times, the people had a custom to make little gatherings where they would sit or stand and talk on the way back from the cemetery when they had buried a good person, a righteous person, an esteemed member of the community, when they had buried a, a good Jew, a believing Jewish person, then they would come back and there would be places for people to sit or to stand and to talk about, continue talking about the loss of this person, what a good special person it was. And that's what they used to do. They didn't just, it wasn't enough or sufficient to just have a service at the Kever. They would continue the discussion and the talking in the morning uh, as they, and the eulogizing uh, on the way back from the Kever at these meeting spots. V'lochein Omar HaKosov, and that's therefore the Pusuk says, that at the time after the Makas Choshech, after the plague of darkness, when all of these uh, people who did not, did not want to, who rejected any identification with B'nai Yisrael when they died during the plague of Choshech, the Torah says the, the Jews did not do these kinds of gatherings to talk about how terrible the loss was. Ella, but rather, or the Torah specifically, in a way, goes out of its way to say they had, or they had light and rejoicing in their Moshvosam, in their dwelling places, as opposed to the dwelling places in the sitting areas where they used to normally, traditionally sit and talk about the loss of, of good people. At a time when normally they would have done their moshavos, their sorrowful, mournful gatherings, there was light and rejoicing in their sitting places and in their dwelling places because uh, the Zerah Shimshon uh, wants to instruct us and teach us something that may, that could be viewed as a hard lesson. And that is that at the time of this great a loss of people, the, the remaining one-fifth of B'nai Yisrael actually saw this uh, in a totally different perspective and reacted with simcha and or with light and rejoicing because these people who did not want to be a part of B'nai Yisrael were in fact removed from being a part of B'nai Yisrael. Uh, Yashukach for everyone for joining us in the Zerah Shimshon uh, tonight. We look forward, God willing, to learning uh, Zerah Shimshon on next week's Parsha.